to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of masculine spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. And soup up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now, here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure coming to you from Waikiki Beach. This morning, my wife and I went down to the beach, and I do the Ocean Sunrise Catechism. Every morning, wherever I am in the world, and usually there's an ocean involved, I flip on Facebook Live, and you can follow us and watch that. We've taken a trip all the way through the Catholic Catechism. We've got about maybe four or five months left on our three-year journey through the Catechism. And guess what we're going to do when we're done? We're going to start over. So... You can follow us on Facebook Live. You probably can't be our friend, but you can follow us, uh, Bear Wozniak, there and participate with our Ocean Sunrise Catechism. It's so cool because uh, I, if I can understand it, you can understand it. And when we open up that Facebook Live every morning, it becomes a thread in the kind of the Facebook Live community there who follows us. They write to each other, pray for each other. It's kind of a cool thing. Uh, so please uh, remember to go to Facebook Live, 7.30 in the morning, wherever I happen to be. So you got to follow me on Facebook to figure out where that is. But 7.30 in the morning... Hawaii time is what we're doing now. Hey, I've got a guest on our show today, and she doesn't know anything about me. She's never watched my radio show, never watched my TV show, so she's kind of in for some trouble. But maybe I'll introduce myself a little bit to you. Uh, we have Dr. Deborah Savage. I'll introduce her in a, in a minute. But I want to tell you something that I do that I think you'll find fascinating, considering that you are a uh, you you focus on uh, the complementarity, I think, of men and men and women. So I'm, before we introduce Dr. Savage, I'm going to do my opening monologue and I'm going to explain to her a little bit about what we do. So I'm a world champion tandem surfer. And what that means is that my wife and I paddle into big waves and uh, I lift her over my head and we do these extreme lifts where she'll do a, she'll, inter she'll stand on my shoulder, interlock arms and then kick up into a handstand or one arm back where I hold her by the small of her back and lift her over my head in an arch. And it's just the most beautiful, uh, visceral, powerful uh, experience I've ever had. I saw it when I was a child in Santa Cruz from the cliffs, Steamers Lane, and I said, I want to do that. And I, I eventually got to the point where I got a really big old board and started training and then trained in the, trained in the, in the uh, competition area and won a couple world titles. And, but it's, it's what, what the, why I'm bringing up tandem surfing is because it's so unique. I was interviewed on the beach in Biarritz, France once, uh, by the local TV sh station, and they said, why, why are tandem surfers so passionate, the, both the men and the women, why are they so stoked about tandem surfing? And there's about 20 teams kind of in a half circle around me uh, during the interview, and I could see their faces while I was talking, and I said, there's a visceral feeling in a man when he uses his prowess and his skill to uh, protect the woman first, to guide the, the ship, the man is the captain of the ship on the, on the tandem board, to drop into a wave and to use, have a, his wits totally about him so he can protect her. Uh, if they're going to fall, the man always takes the hit. My wife asked me once, I thought you said you never had any back surgery, but I see all these scars on your back. That's from me holding the woman close to my, my chest, her back against my chest, as I get drug across the reef because I'm protecting her. Uh, and then when I lift her, I'm thinking constantly, first her safety, first her safety. But when, I, but when we accomplish this amazing thing, on a, can you imagine a 10-foot wave? And you can see it on our, uh, our TV series. We show some of it. But you can see it, I'm, I'm lifting her, and people don't, people don't look at me when we're tandem surfing. They look at the beauty of this woman. She's being lifted over my head. She's athletic. She's showing her prowess. She's showing her skill. She's showing her strength. She's showing her courage. She's showing her trust in me. And the very first thing I have to do as a man who tandem surfs is inspire trust. If a woman doesn't trust her man or her partner, she can't be lifted. She won't trust him to lift her. And men just don't lift women anymore. And we need to lift our women. We need to raise them up. We need to show their beauty and their strength and their power. So as a man, I get to be... The protector, I paddle strong, she paddles with me, we drop in, uh, uh, and we become one with the wave, and we become one with each other, and when I think of the Holy Spirit as the wave, when a man and women are, or a woman are really functioning together on a tandem board, they look like one person. 
We paddle together. They can't even see our, our paddle strokes are in unity. I get up first, but she gets up an eighth of a beat or a sixteenth of a beat later. And from the from the people on the shoreline, it looks like it's one person. She comes back and she I pull her off the board. She gets up off the board. Her back comes against my chest, her face against my cheek, like almost like John at the Last Supper with Jesus. She can feel my my heartbeat. She can feel my motion. She knows when I'm leaning and she flows with me. Uh, we can do a hard bottom turn, spank the lip of the wave and then carve back to the left. And she knows when I'm carving hard to the right, she needs to yield to me. I'll let her knees be flexible. But when I make that that hard left turn, she pushes the board outwards and then pulls me back on the board. It, we're cooperating with each other at all times. And because of that, when people see us out there, they see something powerful, something beautiful, something they've never witnessed before. That, to me, is what a man and a woman are, complementarity. We, we both are equal partners out there, but we have very different jobs, but we do them in unity, and something powerful and beautiful happens. So Dr. Deborah Savage is here. I wanted you to hear that, doctor, because I think it has a lot to do with what you represent. Dr. Deborah Savage is a member of the faculty of St. Paul Seminary School of Divinity at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. And if I don't say that right, the Monsignor will get mad at me. That's what Deborah told me. Did I do okay, <laughs> Deborah? That was perfect. <laughs> so we have Dr. Deborah Savage is here, and she loves St. Thomas, and she loves the writings of John Paul II. And uh, you, one of the things you are is you're the co-founder of the Siena Symposium for Women. But you've been writing and speaking a lot about the complementarity and the, of, of man and woman, the genius, the, ma the masculine genius, genius, the feminine genius. So yeah. we're really stoked to have you on the show. Yeah. Thank you for having me, really. <laughs> your story was just, your description was incredible. Isn't it? Isn't it something? Oh, I don't know of anything else like it in the world. You know, it's beautiful. Yeah. 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 And, and, and Cindy and I, we don't, we do compete if they ask us to, if they need us to, but we do it, uh, we do it now just for the pure love of each other and the love sure. of, the, of the sport. So it's a beautiful two people together striving to accomplish something neither of them could do alone. Yeah, but it also seems to display the particular graces that men and women are both given. Yeah. You know, and I particularly love the word yield. I yeah. love that word. Yeah. W women these days are so unyielding. <laughs> and and that's the, the grace of a woman is her recognition of the moment when yielding is needed. She can but, be strong, but she doesn't have to be strong all the time. You know, what, what is very interesting to me, uh, Deborah, because when I take out, I, I, in the past, I used to teach a lot of people and a lot of tourists. I trained several world champions, but sometimes I'll just take out a tourist and I took out some, I take out sometimes executive women, women that are executive. Yeah. And they say, this is just incredibly refreshing to get to yield to someone and yeah. to trust someone. Right. Right. There's a natural visceral or spiritual deep thing in a woman's yeah. heart. Right. That that they discover again out on the surfboard like that. Yeah, and I think the key thing there is trust because, they, as you said in your opening monologue, um, I don't. I'm not exactly sure why, but women are untrusting also this, these days, and in some cases, men aren't always trustworthy, are they? And so that's distorted the relationship. Then a woman's afraid to yield because she's not sure if she'll be safe. So I what you described was just perfect. The man, if the woman doesn't trust the man, it's because he hasn't inspired that trust. Yeah. He hasn't. He hasn't earned the trust. Yeah. In in yeah, in ninety percent of the cases. Yeah. So I I guess this might be a little bit early in the conversation for me to bring up scripture, but I want I'm reminded of the passage just after the fall, when God shows up in the garden and the men men and man and the woman are both getting their hearing their consequences. And most people don't take note of the fact that the first thing God says to the man is not because you ate of the fruit. He says, because you listened to your wife. Oh, that was your 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Because you listened to your wife, this is what will happen to you. And that is not because men aren't supposed to listen to their wives. It's because what the subtext I've concluded is because you listen to your wife and not to me, God. Because a man, his, if, once he forgets that all authority comes from God and that he is mediating something that isn't his to his family, to the woman, to the world, then he, he's not actually trustworthy. 
you see? So uh, a man's humility is found in recognizing his place in the order of creation. And if he mm. forgets that, then he's not trustworthy. I mean, it's, you know, men, you know, it doesn't mean you have to be thinking about it all the time, but there's this recognition of the gift that you are to the world that is particularly true, well, for both men and women, but uh, men don't get reminded of that very often anymore. And so I think that's part of the problem. We're talking with Dr. Deborah Savage. She is the uh, a member of the faculty at St. Paul Seminary School of Divinity at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we're going to be talking more about her uh, study of St. Thomas Aquinas and John Paul II's Theology of the Body in, re in, in the complementarity of men and women and the genius of man and the genius of woman. I'm glad how you said men have genius too, so <laughs> we'll yes. talk about that a little bit. Uh, you can find us at uh, deepadventure.com. You can subscribe to our newsletter, and we will send this radio show out to you, which is heard by millions around the world. We will actually send it to you as a YouTube video on Saturday mornings before it even airs. So uh, we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. Hey, our TV show, Long Ride Home, is the first, is only the second TV show in EWTN history to be picked up by the Armed Forces Network, too. And, of course, we're evangelistic. We want to reach outside the, the Vatican walls and reach people maybe never even been to church. But, so it is also, I think, the only the second EWTN show to ever go up on uh, iTunes, Amazon Prime Video, and Google Play. So you guys can, uh, especially you women, grab your men, sit them down, find us on iTunes, get them all set down, turn it on and say, I want you guys to watch this. After the first, the first three minutes, they'll be captivated. Uh, season one, Within the first three minutes, we're riding our motorcycles through a hurricane. So it grabs people's attention, and then we challenge men to be men again, manly virtue, uh, and and trusting in the Lord. So we want to encourage you guys uh, to uh, to go to iTunes and watch it. And season two will be coming out on EWTN in about two months, so you'll be able to see us. Season one, we rode from Cocoa Beach to Monterey, California, uh, through the Big Bend country. And season two, we rode from Cocoa Beach down to Key West with Archbishop Wenske up to New Jersey down uh, the tale of the dragon and meeting with Bishop Noonan in Orlando. So uh, you'll just love this show. It's gritty men uh, who love each other, who have seen the worst of each other, by the way, on the road, everything comes out. So we encourage you to watch Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. You can watch one free episode on YouTube, but after that, you need to go to iTunes and you, your $15.99 for all 10 episodes helps us do the next uh, series. So uh, enjoy Long Ride Home with Bear. We're talking today with Dr. Deborah Savage, She's a member of the faculty at the St. Paul Seminary School of Divinity at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul. And uh, we're so thrilled to have you on the show. I really want to get right into this. Uh, Deborah uh, is an expert or focuses on the genius of man and woman, the complementarity of, of men and woman, the anthropological nature of man and woman. She's a, she teaches philosophy. She teaches theology. So she's kind of smart. So all you knuckle draggers out there kind of like <laughs> squint your eyes a little bit and listen in better. <laughs> uh, so, so Deborah, thank you so much for being on the show. Can you give us just a brief background of your uh, your conversion and your, your 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 growth in the Lord, and then you made a big leap, I think, from the private sector into uh, you know in, into uh, getting your doctorate and doing what you do now. Can you just share us yeah, briefly yeah. on that? Because I want to get we want to know who you are. We're okay. going to check you out right now. Okay. Well, I was born in California, so I know, and I actually grew up in Saratoga, Los Gatos area, so I've been to Steamers Lane. Oh, yeah. So you mentioned yeah. that, yes. Oh, yeah. I never surfed, but I, I body surfed, but I never Really, you did? Sports. So you know the feeling, though. Oh, my gosh. Yes, yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the one thing I miss about California is the ocean and my family, but I miss It's still the there. Well. It's still there. I know. I know. California um, hasn't fallen into the ocean yet, either, by the way. No, not yet, but... Well, there's a lot of traffic, <laughs> but anyway. And so I grew up Catholic, and I uh, never really thought, I'd, I guess I'd say I didn't ever question anything about that until I got to college, of course. I went to college in 1970, so you can do the math. And um, I have to tell everybody out there that it was a nightmare because I lived through the sexual revolution. I went to college about an hour away. Where did you go to school? San Jose State University. San Jose State, the first football game I ever went to, a college football game was San Jose Very State. Cool. But, I mean, you yeah. were at the hippie capital of the world right there. 
No, I was. Yeah. And I, I put myself through college working in the semiconductor industry. Uh, so I worked in a factory. And um, I the, the conversion story kind of starts there because my dad had always told me that I was a hopeless idealist. And when I grew up, I'd find out truth and reality had nothing to do with one another. And my business professors told me the same thing, that you couldn't get ahead by doing the right thing. And I thought that doesn't make any sense. So I wow. did an experiment wow. that first year after I graduated, I became a production supervisor. And I decided to do one year uh, in the continue in the factory to see if he was right or if I was right. Because I would always say, well, they must be connected somehow. Mm. <laughs> so anyway, to make a long story short, hopefully, um, <laughs> within a year, I, dis I discovered I was right. I proved I was right because I had a famous production line at Advanced Micro Devices in California. And doing doing things right. Doing things right. I never Treating lied. people right. I told my, I treated my people right. I told the boss when I thought he was wrong. I told the boss when I thought I made a mistake, everything. Because I wasn't gonna, actually I said to myself, if, if he was right and I was wrong, I'm not gonna fight the good fight my whole life. I'm gonna move to Hawaii and surf mm -hmm. and drink daiquiris all day if there's no mm -hmm. way to win. But I proved to myself that I was right, that you could get ahead by doing the right thing. Okay, so skip ahead. And I discovered years later that many of the principles I managed by were found in Catholic social thought. Amen. We were all worrying about the Japanese and learning Japanese manufacturing and management techniques. Theory Z or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, Kaizen, all that. All the principles that they taught us about were actually in the Catholic social tradition mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. And that really interested me. And so I had a kind of uh, empirical question then at that point, after years of being in business, I had my own consulting firm trying to get people to pay attention to these methods that the Japanese had been so successful with. And I learned the Japanese succeeded because of their own spiritual traditions, especially Confucius, Confucian virtue ethics. And I thought, well, wh what is there in the Judeo-Christian tradition that should be informing our work behavior in the same way and doesn't seem to be. Because people in the uh, U.S. go to church on Sunday, work on Monday, and there's this gap. That's what drove me to graduate school. And I I have to say, I was a Catholic, I was a good, decent Catholic, you know, everything. But um, when I encountered the church's teaching in all its fullness, mm -hmm. the longer I am at this, the more in love with the church I am. Mm -hmm. Amen. Her wisdom is profound and broad and ancient. And, um, I mean, there's plenty more little wrinkles to the story. You and fell in love, you and fell in love, you fell in love with truth. I, well, I did. Well, in fact, I've always been in love with truth, but I, mm. I didn't fully appreciate it until I started to study. But you pursued truth. You pursued. I, I did. And it, it pursued me. Cause to tell you the truth, I never thought I'd teach in a seminary. <laughs> this is definitely God's plan, right? Because it sure wasn't mine. I thought I'd teach business ethics, maybe. Or yeah, something. yeah. Well, a good friend of mine's a professor of law up in Boise. He was just here. He, he's been focusing on ethics his, his whole career. Uh, but uh -huh. now, so, 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 what I want to get into is this eventually led you to this, this, this understanding of uh, John Paul II, theology of the body, <laughs> personalism, uh, the anthropological nature, the ontological nature of man. Um, all these ology words, philosophy yeah. and theology and all that stuff. But yeah. tell me, in the nitty gritty of it, is there a, are men and women the same? Is there a difference between them? Well, there's definitely a difference between them. In fact, the research reveals all sorts of differences, which we can talk about. But I want to say, first of all, when I told my mom about it, she said, why don't people just call me? Because every woman with, every parent with children knows that boys and girls are different right from the start. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, I guess I want to start by saying that I, I wrote my dissertation on John Paul II, but not on, on men and women or anything. And then as I, when I graduated, I pursued his teaching more, and I found out about the mulieris dignitatum and the feminine genius and all that. And at a certain point, I realized that the, if there was a feminine genius, there had to be a masculine one. And so I have actually taken his project several steps further. It's going to take centuries to unpack all that he did, you know? Oh, yeah, And, and so he and needs my, your help to continue the, 
one scholar can't everything yeah, anyway. Right, right, right. Definitely, um, I imagine we'll have to talk about this at, in the next segment, but what my research shows is that you can derive from Scripture uh, the fact that men and women are both equally human because, the, as the philosophers were, would say, they're both substantiations of the same substantial form, meaning that they're both equally human. They both have a human soul, and yet they're different. The first account proves the, the equality of men and women, and the second account reveals the differences between them. And that that's uh, those are the questions I approached my research with, and I discovered quite a number of things. Um, when you bring questions to the academic study, certain questions, it's kind of amazing, and an open mind. It's kind of amazing what you discover. That's in the tradition of Thomas Aquinas. That's right. Right. That's so we're talking right. with yeah. Dr. Deborah Savage. She is. I'm going to give you her exact title. She's a member of the faculty. In fact, she teaches philosophy and theology at the Saint Paul Seminary School of Divinity at the University of Saint Thomas in Saint Paul, Minnesota. Uh, and you know, of course, I just love Saint Thomas. He rocked my world when I when I read yeah. the Summa, and I'm sure yours too. And Deborah is going to talk to us more about, you know, just the nuts and bolts of what makes a man and a woman different. If they want to find you, reach out to you, how, what's the best place for them to find you, Dr. De Dr. Savage? Well, I would go to the Siena Symposium website, and it's actually the Siena Symposium for Women, Family, and Culture, but they can just Google Siena, one that's N. What, what's with the S? Like, S-I-E-N-A. Okay, good. Siena Symposium. And... Um, the uh, they'll find my email address there. Okay. Uh, this yeah. is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're going to be talking more about the difference between men and women when we get right when we get back. Uh, be right back in a few minutes. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You know, in the evenings here, we we're, we're here in Waikiki Beach. My house is right next to. Uh, the Catholic Church, I can look down right where the altar is. We're building the St. Mary Ann and St. Damien Museum right now between me and the church, which is just a very little narrow area. And it's so beautiful. I look out my window towards the horizon, and I'll see sailboats and merchant ships and, and uh, whales, although they'll probably be leaving here in a week or so. And uh, you look out over that horizon, you know, and a surfer knows we paddle out. We leave the aina, the land behind us, the place of temporal values where everything always changes. And we paddle out into the Makai. We paddle out into the deep. And once you get about two miles out here in Hawaii, maybe three miles out, the ocean drops down two miles. We basically live on a mountain sticking out of the sea here. To me, that is Catholic teaching. It's time for you to get out of the shallow end of the pool, paddle out into the deep, where you're the depth and the breadth of Catholic teaching, as our guest, Dr. Deborah Savage, mentioned earlier, is incredible. So let's dig down a little bit. Can you tell me, can you give an example of the difference between men and women, like a real life sort of thing to make it real for us? What okay. Year, yeah. Um, how about the bad example? Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So uh, my husband and I have a regular faith meeting where we go to a, which is in an old church in downtown St. Paul. And we have a holy hour, and then we go downstairs, and there's a number of people, men and women, who are in this group. It's act, we're actually lay missionaries of charity. And we go downstairs into the basement of this uh, church where we have our meetings after the holy hour. And this one night, just a couple years ago, uh, we walked into the basement. And in the, in the basement there, there's a little t six-foot table maybe in the middle of the room. That's all there is. It's some chairs around it. We walked into the room, and there's this bat flying around the, the room. And it was, it was just scary. It was hysterical. It was afraid. It was scared. It was flying everywhere, frantically trying to get out. And what happened next was so amazing, so indicative. Within a nanosecond, all the women in my group, in the group, were underneath the one table in the room. <laughs> there over their heads because they're the fear is that the bat's going to get in your hair i guess including my daughter maddie who was just 10 at the time there was no discussion there was no what shall we do they were just immediately underneath that table and of course in the same nanosecond what were the men doing they were 
looking for brooms, looking for uh, mops, dustpans, garbage bags, garbage pails, whatever they could find to ca- in order to capture the bat. And in, in this, you know, with no discussion, no standing around, what shall we do? It was immediate and instantaneous. And I mean, at the mo- at that time, I wasn't worried about it too much. But in retrospect, I realized how revealing that was. That the men knew immediately that their job was to protect, and the women said, "I don't want anything to do with that bat. I'm underneath the table." And I tell my my audiences, you know, yes, the women could have captured the bat, but I know for sure that we would have ceded the room to the bat and called the maintenance man, to tell him that he had a bat in his basement. And so um, that, to me, that's one really good example of what you were describing in your opening monologue, that man's task to protect and to serve, it was just so obvious right in that moment, and the women didn't hesitate to count on them. What, what t- let, let, help me out with this. Tell yeah. me what, uh, and by the way, did they get the bat? They did. And of course, <laughs> they caught the bat. And then what did the women say? Oh, please don't kill the poor thing. Right. You know? Yeah. So, well, yeah. Tell, tell us this. What would you say are the main attributes of the feminine genius, genius, genius and yeah. the, main, the main attributes of the, of the manly genius? Well, um, a woman's, John Paul II says this also, and it's also in scientific uh, data, that um, women seem to be more oriented toward persons, right? that our first reach is the personal. And um, you can trace this back to, to Genesis, actually, Genesis 2, because the moment at which woman is created is the moment at which hu- a human community enters the scene. Adam has no future without woman, and in fact, she's created to be divine aid to Adam, and um, he recognizes her as a person, and so there's all sorts of things that you can say about it. But the prior to that moment, or uh, what I want to say is, a woman has never lived in a created order that was not already inhabited by persons, because Adam was already there. So, and then the science, as I said, also indicates that uh, little girls, for example, infant girls can know, will recognize the sound of a baby crying as opposed to somebody dropping a dish on the floor within four hours of birth. Mm-hmm. Boys don't it don't don't notice. So women's task is orient their their charism is toward person. Mm-hmm. But I argue from my analysis of scripture is that man's charism is found in his orientation toward things. That because man in the garden is tasked with naming everything, he takes dominion over those things. St. Thomas Aquinas says he had to have been given a distinct preternatural gift for that even to have been possible. This explains why man sees that his task is to um, recognize what things are for and um, sort of use the goods of creation to serve and protect his family and the the community in which he lives and in fact this gift of man to the world that he he, it does turn into a, a, a problem if he becomes too obsessed with it or becomes a workaholic let's say and that happens but in its initial reach it's really his great gift to the world to be able to conquer nature if you will or conquer is probably a iffy word now but to make use of the goods of creation to serve his family. And really, um, that's the origin of his instinct to protect and to serve and to provide for his family. It's because of men that civilizations have been built um, and been sustained for, you know, since time began. Really, literally, if it weren't for men, we would still be living in caves afraid to come out. So... Those are some initial thoughts. You can stop there and see what you think. No, I just think, too, you know, like I know Adam was uh, created from the mud and and was alone. Right. And as a man, I know I have a, a real need for solitude. Right. I, I'm, I love, I, I like to be with my wife all the time, except for every, except for I need to have that time of solitude. And I, frankly, that's my, my cigar and uh, maybe the Summa or Augustine yeah. or a good book. 
and sitting yeah. on my beach chair outside yeah. and, and reading. And that's my solitude. I call cigars solitude makers. You yeah. know, men need that. They've been alone. They need that right. time of solitude. Right. That's um, right. And then, uh, so do, what is the difference? A man is formed out of the mud, the woman from the rib. What does that tell you? Well, what I say in my writing, what I've concluded from Scripture is that, um, this is very interesting, that, um, first of all, to confirm what you just said, man um, is alone in the garden with God for some period of time, which is, a, to me, the origin of his role as the head of the household. Is it? He doesn't necessarily or exactly mediate God to the woman, but in a way he does, right? There's a mis mysterious priority there. It's very interesting, isn't it, how uh, when God spoke to, um, to w the Annunciation with Mary— yeah. That she would give birth, but once, um, once uh, when God's once they were married, and then God spoke to Joseph, right? You know, leave. You know, there's danger. Go here, go there. Right. So there yeah. is that natural. There, there is, we shouldn't deny yeah. that it's the manly way for a man to be ahead of his household. My wife right. is so wise. My wife is so wise and so yeah. mature and so tender. She sees things when I don't see them. Yeah. Uh, and so she give so but but if it, at some point she 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 will she'll go with me you know what I but right. she she sees my back she sees things I don't see but I have an instinct sometimes of what needs yeah. to be done and where we need to go and she knows that she can trust me because she's seen me lay my, my life down to her again and again and again right. which is part of it you know yeah so women actually have better peripheral vision I don't know if you know this just physiologically oh, you should when we walk down the street together she'll say there's someone on we're a busy street of Waikiki there's someone yeah. on your left with the surfboard I mean she's she's yeah <laughs> that's very it's interesting just, I didn't know yes that. it's a fact we have bet more rods and cones in our eyes which means that we can spot out of the corner of our eye when the when the when the, the child when your kids are about ready to jump off a cliff but the man's uh, more more oriented toward uh, you know what's ahead yeah. of him. And so a, a wise woman uh, recognizes what's happening, takes in all that information, but then relies on the man, maybe communicates that to the man so that the man can attend to it. Yeah, it's not, it's, and not just in the physical area, but in, the, in, the, um, in uh, every area. Uh, we're talking right. with Dr. De Deborah Savage. Uh, she is a professor at St. Paul, a, a member of the faculty at St. Paul Seminary School of Divinity at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. We'll be right talk we'll be right back and talk more about uh, the feminine and the manly ge genius as seen by Thomas Aquinas and John Paul II. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak, and today we have as my co adventure guide Dr. Deborah Savage. She is uh, a uh, her whole her life's work now is focusing on the theology of the body um, uh, with a Thomistic uh, approach to the manly genius and the feminine genius, the complementarity of a male and female. I want to ask you a question right now. I feel like the point of the spear of Satan is mm -hmm. pointed, uh, maybe it wouldn't be a spear, maybe it's a hatchet, but is to take off the head of manliness. Mm -hmm. To remove, remove, remove uh, this whole thing about the masculine, uh, toxic masculinity. Uh, yeah. There, there has been a, there's been a target on on the men's head for 40 years or so now, and yeah. uh, and now it's got. Um, what, what do you see? Am I right about that? What do you see in that area about the need to oh, restore yeah. manly virtue and stand up and be men again? Absolutely. Well. Maybe this is a good time to mention that just earlier this year, the American Psychological Association set out guidelines to their members uh, to help uh, psychologists working with men and boys, in which they claimed that masculinity, traditional masculinity, was a pathological state. Now, this was a clinical diagnosis, uh, really gender ideology, I should say, masquerading as a clinical diagnosis. And uh, the influence of the radical feminist movement is very clear. You know, a man opens a door for a woman and he's a sexist. Did I say that right? Yeah, a man opens a door for a woman and he son suddenly he's a sexist. Or, you know, it's, it's just gotten crazy. So I would say, and I've written about this, that 
there's been a war on men, and frankly, for the last 40 years, uh, that has led to this situation where men are not sure what's what's their next best move. I mean, everybody's sort of walking on eggshells. So uh, I would I would agree with that. I think um, I'm not exactly sure why it's happened, except the clue might be in what you said that it's the, the Satan has the tip of the spear pointed at men because what's men's job but to protect the, the civilization protect the women and the children uh, you know in their in their culture uh, the other day I was watching Hacksaw Ridge I don't know if anybody saw that movie I love that movie or Saving Private Ryan the first few minutes of Saving Private Ryan both of those films reveal the genius of men that they lay down their lives to protect their families, their homeland. And uh, it's just astonishing to me that um, well, the, that um, the women in our culture in particular feel so little gratitude for the fact that it's because of men that they're now able to have these posh little jobs in, sitting at desks, or even myself teaching philosophy at a seminary, would not be possible if it weren't for the men that built the building that I'm sitting in, or those that created the technology that make it possible for us even to talk to each other right now, or for all the sacrifices men have made throughout the centuries in the name of the common good. And it's now, not, and excuse it's me. not that women haven't made sacrifices too; they have, and we can talk further about that. But let's but talk. I want to talk. I want to talk yeah, more ahead, about that. Yeah. Um, just the fact that uh, men are being bullied now. Yeah. And they won't stand up to the bully. They, men, you do not need to be confused. You're a man. Uh, you're, there's such a thing as manly virtue. And yes. opening of our show, we talk about masculine spirituality, but I don't do that anymore. That's what the announcer says. I just talk about being manly. A, mm -hmm. manly, a manly man is by by definition a man who lives by the seven virtues justice uh, self mastery prudence uh, fortitude faith hope and love by definition that's what a man is but men yeah. you don't I, I the other day in the ocean uh there's a bully out there that's been very tough on people for all the 25 years or so i've known him out there and i finally had enough enough of him and i paddled out there and i and i announced to everybody he's the greatest surfer in the world he's famous all over the world for being a bully and i called him out and we went to the beach basically ready to fight and um, as we approached the beach, I, 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 I announced to the entire beach, probably 200 people, this man is a world famous surfer. He's famous all over the world. Wherever I travel, they know about him because he bullies people out in the water. He's a famous, famous bully. So he had shamed people public, publicly, and so I did too. And it came down to, to basically, uh, uh, you know, fighting positions, and then the police showed up. So what I'm saying is, men, I can't tell you how good that felt to call out that bully. And men, you need to stop being bullied. Stop feeling like, especially you young men, stop feeling like you can't be a man. Don't let society, social media, your teachers, your, your peers bully you into being some sort of genderless male. It's good. It's a really good feeling to be a man, to feel, for, to feel uh, the virtue of self-mastery, to experience courage and fortitude, to, to understand what it means to lay down your life to, uh, uh, in self-donation to other people, to the, to your family, it feels so good to be a man. Stop being bullied and 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 and, and show Satan to be the punk that he is. Yeah. What about feminine genius? Shall we shall we take a few minutes because the show's about over? Oh. <laughs> what should men see in women? Well, that maybe we yeah, yeah, need yeah. to understand well, more clearly. Sure. Well, you have to keep in mind that, uh, and this is a new insight I have from Scripture. That women are actually not created second, which would make them subservient, let's say. That's been the interpretation of Genesis 2 for all these centuries. Woman is actually created last and on the way up. There's a hierarchy that shows up there in Scripture. Wow. You know, wow. starting with the first account and then coming to fruition in the second. Woman is made of Adam, Adam's rib, right? Adam is made from earth. 
And so I guess I'd ask, which would you rather be made of, mud or something that's already in, uh, has a certain degree of actualization, which is really what Adam is. So woman is made of finer stuff, and she's made on the way up. So woman has the broader view. Um, this is actually what my our priest told us during our marriage preparation, which was surprising to both my husband-to-be and I. The woman has a broader view. So... Uh, you have to listen to her. You have to call out of her the, the, this feminine genius that she possesses. You have to count on her to remind you about the importance of persons. When she calls you to dinner and you're out there doing your thing, don't make her call you five times. Because by the time you get there, by the fifth time, she'll be kind of cranky. <laughs> and if you do that enough times, you create a cranky wife. I mean, I could use a different word, but we probably shouldn't. <laughs> so, you know, listen to your wives. They probably have some wisdom to share with you. And that is that is what I think is true. Women, if they're listened to, they they quiet down. The reason women get shrill is because men don't listen to them. And so they think the only way they can gain get his attention is by talking louder. Actually, if you if you listen more carefully, she will quiet down. She'll relax. She'll feel respected. And so don't, I would say, because of this, women are looking for men that they can count on. And the reason that we don't anymore is because so many men have forgotten what it means to be a man. And to, that doesn't mean to be, um, you know, what all, all the things that are come under the heading of toxic. It means to be virtuous like you were describing there a really virtuous man always catches a woman's attention just like a virtuous woman catches a man's we're looking for that in each other that's what i think i love what you say you know cindy and i have both been through the healing of an annulment you know and yeah. then we found each other and were married and when we're in the it seems like usually in the evenings but i ask her questions about her day and, and I listen intently and I love to listen to her talk. When she starts talking to me, I just want to turn all my attention to her and just listen. And she said, no one's ever cared to even listen to me before. Yeah. And, uh, and to me, she's fascinating to listen to. She's fun. She's, I just love the way she, who she is. And, and, and so I spend, I'll, I'll drag that conversation on as long as she will let me. <laughs> she's mm -hmm. tired of it. But I want to yeah. hear about her day, about every little thing. Yeah, and it's part. It's just, but when you listen to a woman, um, the the insight that she has, the alertness to uh, danger, it's, it's just incredible to me the the impact she has on me. And, they, and also, she really gets me. We're going to wrap this up, but I'm going to just say this to you: When I met Cindy, uh, she had seen me tandem surfing. I ended up taking her out. I was training, trying to teach her someone else how to tandem surf with with her. And I finally told him, "You're not allowed to surf with her anymore because you hurt her." And he took her out again, and when I saw her fall on her. And she was walking to the beach. I walked down to the beach. I signaled her, to come, signaled to her to come to me. And I paddled out with her. And we did three beautiful overhead lifts. And she had never done that before with this other guy who didn't protect her. But, yeah. um, but I'm saying that because uh, there is this, there is this um, uh, admiration that I have for her, for her, her, her knowledge, her strength of person. And I listened to her. And, my list, and when, when she, at one point she said, someday some man's going to challenge men to be men again. And I said, you don't know what I do, do you? And she goes, well, no, <laughs> she just thought I was a surfer. And so she has that anointing also. She had that same desire before we even met for someone yeah. to do that. So she has a vision. She understands my calling. And so her, her we, you know, I just love her and admire, and, and I learned so much from her. Uh, <laughs> I guess I went off topic a little bit. Dr. Savage, <laughs> um, we got to get going. Uh, yeah. Where can they find you again? The Siena... Sienna Symposium for Women, Family, and Culture. I want to mention that we study both masculinity and femininity. We're, we have men come to our stuff and everything. So How can you do one without the other, really? You can't. And I just want, can I just, do I have time to finish with one thing? Yep. JB2 said, John Paul II said that complementarity is what gives us our mission, which is to create not only human families, but human history mm. itself. Mm. And I'm, I, the reason I'm on this mission is because I think we are uh, complicit in the devil's game if we don't find a way to work together 
relying on our, our, our charisms, but work together to return all things to Christ. This is what we are called to do. We cannot do it by ourselves. Women can't do it by themselves, and men can't do it by themselves either. You absolutely can't have the masculine genius without grasping the feminine and vice versa. You're absolutely right. Did you guys like that? Isn't that great? we got to get uh, Dr. Savage back on our show. This is the Bear oh, Wozniak Adventure. To- yeah, we'd love to have you back. <laughs> and until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha! You've been listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Go to bearwozniak.com to get your free audio and other exciting content. Plus, you can pick up the Long Ride Home 10-episode DVD set, autographed copies of Bear's books, Long Ride Home shirts, tanks, coffee cups, and even motorcycle pins and patches. And find out how guys can sign up for Bear's Man Cave online Facebook group, all at bearwozniak.com. 